ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our event tonight. It's a joint event between Business Change Central uh, North London and South London branches. It is a committee member for Business Exchange and also committee member for North London and Central London. Central London. Uh, Steve will introduce. Well, yeah, well, welcome to everyone and hello, hello again, Kitty. Um, so today, yeah, today's the topic is uh, challenges to business analysts in 2023. And you, you will no doubt have read Kitty's uh, biography on the website uh, with 23 years uh, experience of working. 24 now, 23. <laughs> <laughs> counting. Well, more than 20 years experience uh, of working with a, variety, a, a wide variety of, of, of different types of, of, of different types of organisations, and she will share her. Well, I was going to say experience, but we're looking forward. So it's a it, it's a prediction based based on uh, based on experience, a prediction of the, the, the types of challenges that will require business analysts to be involved in business change, looking at sort of threats and opportunities. And so on. So quite a, a wide ranging, wide ranging talk. Um, well, I've, written, I've got written down here all the different headings, but Kitty will tell you all about the different headings. So not much more to say. So welcome. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for your time in coming to um, see my talk. And tonight, as Steve says, I'm going to share with you uh, some insights about the uh, challenges to business analysts uh, in 2023. Based on my research on the global events that happened in 2022. No moment, sorry, got it. Yeah. A little bit about me. Um, I've been a through and through BA in the best part of my career. So I got my PhD in computer science back in the late 90s. And then after that, I worked in academia for a couple of years. And then I joined the telecommunication industry for a couple of years. And before I joined the central government uh, in the London Metropolitan Police. And after a good 15 years, I returned to the private sector and I worked in the uh, consultancy defense uh, industry. So last year, exactly March last year, I was very honored to be made a BCS fellow. As a part of my fellowship commitment, I said to BCS, I would like to uh, spend my personal time in volunteering with BCS and help them in membership roles, and also to share my uh, experience with uh, fellow uh, business analysts. So I don't want my 24 years experience to get wasted. <laughs> so that's me. Um, here's my agenda. Uh, I'm sure most of you have heard about PESO analysis. It's about political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental. I found the PESO analysis is so powerful because when I analyze the politics and then you just trigger down all the uh, economic, social, and other factors. So I use this to analyze the global events in 2022. And then as a result, I concluded some challenges faced by the world, but being a BA, I can speak for business analysts, and I want to drill down to what kind of challenges particularly faced by BA in this very, in this world in a very bad shape, I must admit. Um, I would like to share with you four key takeaways, and so I hope you will uh, go home and bring these four key takeaways with you in your workplace tomorrow. Uh, it's my attempt to kind of transfer the challenges to opportunities to BA, because otherwise there's no point to come here to speak for an hour if I do not have any constructive um, mechanism to turn the challenges to opportunities. So this is a summary of the PESO. In 2022, I think you all agree that 2022 was not a good year. It, it was a quite a, quite a year with a quite a bad shape especially the Russian invasion to Ukraine. I would say uh, everything changed since the invasion. The Ukraine is a very important country with a lot of resources, a lot, lot of materials, uh, raw materials. Russia is also a very important country. It's one of the biggest exporters of oil and gas. 
So we here, geographically in Europe, we have been impacted by the invasion a lot more than Asia, more than North and South America, even more than as uh, Asia Pacific region. So in the from our viewpoint in Europe, we now suffer from very high price of uh, energy, the oil and gas because of the sanction. So and a lot of industry, they still use oil and gas. So it drives up the inflation. Ukraine being a uh, one of the largest food exporters in the world. And that's why our grocery price has gone up so much. And also one of the byproducts of oil and gas, don't forget, is fertilizer. So the short taste of fertilizer also impact on uh, food production. So you can see the e political factor has just uh, trigger all the economic factors. And on the other hand, another key uh, event in the world is the threat from China to invade Taiwan. As you probably know, Taiwan is also a very important country in terms of technology. It is the world's largest exporter of the most sophisticated and uh, semiconductors and computer microchips. So with the threat, it has some kind of disruption and also they rely on the material, raw materials from Ukraine. Ukraine is a, one of the countries produce a, a lot of um, uh, uh, rare earth. The rare earth is a key element to make computer chips and semiconductors. So you, you can see anything happen in the political side, trigger the economic side. And then with the high price of uh, inflation, the uh, uh, re recession, you can see the drop of GDP, then what, what happened in the social side? People are facing high cost of living, but their wages are not catching up. So the social side, there kind of some social unrest, um, especially the strike um, industry action and protest. I'm not making it up. Um, today's Evening Standard front page, Three quarters of London school hit as teachers strike again. Um, it's a fact. So there are strikes on transportation, like train strikes, education, teachers, university lecturers, uh, border force of officers, uh, postal worker. Um, so all sorts of uh, frontline um, workers, they come out to go and try to um, just to uh, get their uh, more a fair, fairer pay to meet the high cost of living. So this is the, as a result of political and economic. So I mentioned about um, the uh, threat of invasion from Russia, uh, from uh, China to Taiwan. That has triggered the shortage of supply in um, uh, computer chips, as well as the in Ukraine, there, there's a shortage of the rare earth. Uh, for the production of um, the very important ingredients of the microchips and semiconductors. Another te technological factor in 2022, all of a sudden, it, um, there's a big tech giant's redundancies. A lot of people blame Elon Musk. They said Elon Musk started it. When he took over Twitter in October 2022, he basically fired half of the workforce. And then other companies like Meta, Facebook, Amazon, uh, and also even Apple and Microsoft, they all make their redundancy. Um, I'm, going to, I'm just telling you the facts, but I'm going to do some analysis in my latest slides. So because of the tension between Russia and the West. It triggered the legal aspect. We got the cyber warfare. As you know, now, nowadays, war doesn't have to be bullets and missile. Um, if your enemies uh, attack your um, national grid or uh, the water supply system, the enemies won because you cannot run the country. And then we have cyber threats and the IPR. Intellectual, pop intellectual property right. I think in this aspect, you, you probably will agree with me, the biggest big breakthrough in 2022 is the launch of uh, OpenAI ChatGPT. 
So nowadays, yeah, now it's taking over the whole uh, internet and it has changed some of the habits of um, search engine um, because it gives you an answer rather than the list of uh, URLs for you to look for. However, the chat GPT doesn't give you any citation references or credits to the content creator. So that, but there's the, at the moment, the, there's not enough uh, legislation or regulations to actually govern the IPR if the content is generated by AI, not a human. If it's generated by human, it can be subject to plagiarism. So the person will be accountable, but if generated by AI, uh, is the uh, authority going to prosecute the engineer who are behind the algorithm? Or if what if the algorithm is generated by another AI? It's very complicated. I don't have an answer. I'm just here to tell you. <laughs> And also the lack of black regulation in some emerging technologies. Emerging technologies, they are very useful. They are very, very, they, they, they will make the world a better place. That's, uh, there's no dispute. However, emerging technology is very immature, very new. The legislations cannot catch up with the emerging technologies. So in 2022, in November, there's a collapse of a, the world's second biggest uh, cryptocurrency platform called FTX. And all of a sudden, 10 billion US dollars of customer deposit just vanished when they filed for bankruptcy. And because the, there's no regulation in the cryptocurrency market, so customer deposit just gone. So I'm just saying it, I don't have an answer. In terms of environment, Another problem triggered by the political side is the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Because of the sanction, Europe has to cut off all the oil and gas supply from Russia. So it means that they have to think about how to meet the demand to their population. Do they need, uh, do they need to go back to the uh, fossil fuel in order to meet the demand? Or will they need, uh, leave the population to become blacked out? So Germany actually had reactivated uh, their coal plant. As you know, coal is not particularly uh, environmentally friendly um, energy. So they actually go back one step forward and three step backward because of the political problem. So this is my summary of the pestle. In 2023, so what, what do, what do I think will happen in 2023? I don't know, but it looks like the war is going to drag on for another months or years. Um, as long as the war is still here, I think we will continue to see the inflation, uh, high cost of living, um, uh, even recession. Someone actually predicted the recession will loom through 2023. Um, I want to touch upon about COVID backlog. Um, while most of the world, uh, we seem to have gone back to normal. We, seem to, we got over the COVID with the vaccination and uh, herd immunity. But China, um, being the world's largest um, manufacturers and exporter, they actually only opened up uh, just before Christmas 2022, after three solid years of uh, zero COVID lockdown. So it means that their population doesn't really have the herd immunity. So when they open up, the people will get infected and they may take leave from work. So there will be some kind of uh, uh, delay uh, in the manufacturing. And if, there's, if the manufacturing is if get delayed, there may be the impact on the export and logistics. That's how I see the, the COVID backlog in terms of manufacturing and logistics. Yeah, so uh, we have different sorts of strides. Uh, I think unless the cost of living is um, become closer to the gap between cost of living and salary, become closer again. Otherwise, we will still see more and more strikes. Very bad news. I'm sorry.
but I'm just saying it. In terms of uh, the shortage of advanced microchips, um, there's an article actually say the microchip shortage might last till 2024. Because even though uh, Ukraine, maybe Russia will withdraw and Ukraine be uh, become alive again, but it still takes time to rebuild their infrastructure. So the the materials like the rare earth will not be uh, become available all of a sudden. So that's why someone predicts uh, the, the shortage will last till 2024. The, the microchips is for many, many precision equipment. Um, electric car, your internet of things, uh, even military equipment like missiles and um, drones and robotics, they all need the uh, sophisticated microchips and semiconductors. It is a key component for computer hardware. Yeah, I touched upon the uh, big tech uh, redundancy. I don't think Elon Musk uh, has got all the blame. I think it is to do with the, the whole global economic uh, situation. Because as a business owner, they look at uh, the inflation, the high cost of energy. So they have to find a way to run their business sustainably in order to survive. So th they will look at, mm, how do I treat my business? How, what areas should I uh, cut down in order to save costs? So a lot of big tech giants, they have a commonalities. Uh, they, they actually lay off more managers than developers because they think managers just manage. The developers, they actually have the direct involvement in the customer uh, work, the direct involvement in the profitability. So they stay, they actually stay. Um, last night, I saw a Twitter post, Elon Musk sacked another 2,500 staff again. So now Twitter actually have a quarter of their workforce, but the, a quarter of workforce, are, they are developers. They are not managers. So that's, that's the pattern you can see. The big tech giants and uh, redundancy, they actually trim down the uh, back office support and managerial uh, staff. Yeah, I look at the cyber warfare and um, as a, there's an article, actually, they said, well, we need to uh, do something between um, the threats from Russia and China. Um, it, it's getting more and more uh, tension and the other one is um, uh, someone actually proposed to set the regulation of cryptocurrency market, like the traditional uh, fiat currency market, like the traditional banking system. Because at the moment, the cryptocurrency market is pretty much unregulated. I mean, I'm thinking, even casinos are regulated. How come this cryptocurrency market is not regulated? Um, so they, they're working, working on it. I'm not the policymaker, but I just kind of raised this to share with you what, what's going on in this area. Yeah, I touched upon about the en en environmental aspect. Um, if we, uh, if country need to uh, choose between energy security and sustainability, uh, most country will choose energy security. And that con contradict the philosophy of ESG. ESG is uh, environmental, social, and governance. Yeah, I say an example, Germany has reactivated the coal plant after cutting off the natural gas and oil from Russia. So this is my summary of the challenges uh, faced by the world. Um, I would say beyond 2023, because Today is second of March. We we already on the, in the third month of uh, uh, 2023. Um, we have much change change much uh, since January, since the beginning of the year. The, the ongoing uh, situation is the Russian invasion to Ukraine, the threat from China to invade Taiwan, the border conflicts between China and India and the North Korean missile drill around South Korean border. So this, it, as long as these threats are still ongoing, still looming, that has an impact to the economic situation and 
the social situation, technological situation, and legal situation, and environmental situation. They all inter interconnected. So I mentioned about the big tech redundancies because as a business owners, they need they really need to uh, find ways to uh, run their business more economically. They look at cost saving, efficiency um, to sustain their business. And, and also they want they also want to continue to look at the profitability. So although there are challenges, the business owners they they are looking at using emerging technologies automation to help them to get through all this uh, bad time. Another way they uh, is okay as a business owner. My 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 workforce had they gone out on strike. I have no productivity. I am losing my money. I cannot serve my customers. So what do they do? They look at maybe do some automation. So if they have automation, at least they can continue to provide goods and product and services to the public um, while their workforce is on strike. As much as I feel very empathetic. To the to those people on strikes, is their right? But it's not the scope of this seminar. It will be another seminar. I'm here as a BA. I'm here as a BA to look at how I can support business owner, how I can support to adopt automation, emerging technologies to help them resolve the issues. That's my position today. Another one is the regulation uh, challenges, the regulation to uh, look at the emerging technology. For example, I cited the ChatGPT, uh, OpenAI. How do we solve the regulation, the IPR regulation about the um, citation, uh, credit, or references to the con back to the content creators? Uh, um, and also, the other regulation is um, how can the law uh, maker, the policy makers, uh, to regulate the emerging technologies market in the uh, cryptocurrency? Because they use blockchain as a technology to run the cryptocurrency uh, exchange platform. So what what they look at? They look at these are only just a few examples. They look at AI. They look at machine learning. They look at IoT. Uh, robotic automation, um, quantum computing. These are kind of technologies. They are they are looking at whether they can adopt it and resolve the issues. So now this the we come down to the key uh, elements. What are the challenges to us as a BA? So I I met some BAs. Then they. Um, they said, well, um, the global um, events, nothing to do with me because I'm now in the working in the massive transformation program until 2026. I'll be all right in the next three years. I don't have to worry, worry about it. Um, but I think they're wrong because um, with the global event, a business owner, they may rethink about how they run the business. So business priority might change. Uh, your customers might cancel the project. They might run out of money or they might want to transfer the money to uh, invest in other projects. So they might cancel the project. So all of a sudden, the BA think they will have another three years uh, in this transformation program. All of a sudden, they're out of project. So if the BA um, out of the project then the BA need to identify opportunities to survive. So my proposition is some, um, we need to do some work. We need to enhance our skills in, so we can have more, it's like a um, sweet army knife. The more, the more knives we have, the more opportunities we can get involved to support the, 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 uh, the customers. The first proposition, I think we can, we should, we skill and upskill ourselves to expand our knowledge in business analysis to business advisory. Instead of become a listener, a note taker, 
a lot of people call us PA as a note taker. I, I don't like it, but they, they treat us like a note taker, a, a follow up to be a thought leader. We need to do more work. We need to acquire more um, knowledge, uh, but we do. We need to do it in order to enhance our opportunity in the in in the in in our business in our uh, occupation. And also, we need to develop technical skill because if the business owners they're looking at automation, um, emerging technology to help them overcome all these difficulties, save costs, improve efficiency, combat the uh, strike threats. So as a BA, we need to acquire this knowledge in order to, to support them. So that's my, I think the, cha I, the challenges can be converted to opportunities to us, but we do need to do some work. So before I drill down to details, I have listed here four key takeaways. Remember, nobody is um, standalone, nobody is silo. Whatever happens in the so affect us as a BA as a profession. And I would like to lead you to the thought to expand yourself from business analysis to business advisory. And I do believe that emerging technologies equal to emerging opportunities to us. And lastly, the takeaways, emerging technologies are very new and very immature and not very regulated. So when we do the traditional BA work, uh, requirement capturing, asking questions, we need to really pay a lot more attention than the traditional IT project you're working on. Um, an application on the flat screen is a static 2D application. Emerging technologies, robotic, drone, everything. Uh, you have to consider a lot of their cybersecurity, physical security, also the ethic, the compliance, and the, uh, the regulations. You need to really pay particular attention to it. So now, what do I mean by expanding ourselves from business analysis to business advisory? I'm proposing six steps, uh, maybe more, but at least a start. So, Step number one, efficiency. So when you, traditionally, when you, when you, as a BA, you go to a project, the project already has a budget, already have a business case. So already have a project manager, already have a scrum team. So you just go to BA, okay, I'm, a, I'm an agile BA or I'm a, I'm a product owner and you just uh, capture user requirements, uh, create user stories and uh, work with the technical dev off or developer to um, implement the solutions. However, as a business advisor, you need to look at, is this project supporting the efficiency, supporting the cost saving of the organization? If not, challenge it. Don't just listen to the project manager. That's what I mean as a business advisor. So use your judgment. So always remember you are here to help your customers improve efficiency to save costs. Anything goes against it, don't be afraid, don't be hesitant, challenge it. And please feel free to offer alternative solution. The second one is cost saving. Also think about cost saving, how we can help customers save costs. Um, for example, I just have two examples, but there can be more and more examples. There's some, the cloud computing um, can save the cost for uh, our customers. They don't have the total cost of ownership of the hardware. Um, they don't have to run their data center, the cloud computing. Um, we can save costs or we can also advise what kind of hardware can uh, be more environmental friendly, use uh, more like a, a green, greener hardware. And also if the, if the customers have the um, surface management, we can also advise the customer whether we can do the surface design as a surface, S-D-A-A-S, because that, that could also save the customer cost. Uh, if they outsource the surface design, surface management uh, uh, um, department. The third one is called Agile Mindset. I have worked in many Agile projects. Fine, you've got Agile project, 
we've got a um, daily stand up, we've got the spring planning, we've got show and tell, we've got retrospective, we um, also have the velocity, we have burn up chart, burn down chart, and we uh, do the sprint and we deliver to the business, fine, that's fine. Well, I mean the agile mindset in the customer side, my experience has shown to me in the customer side, their, their procurement department and their commercial department, they don't like agile projects because they like waterfall. Tell me how much and then I put in my budget. I can't because agile is incremental. They, because they don't appreciate the flexibility of agile in incremental, you got the MVP and then if the customers, they can uh, increase the requirements or they can change the requirements throughout the project. So we, we can only tell them how much will it cost uh, as a result of the sprint planning. Okay, in this sprint, I think we used uh, how many people and how many user stories and how much effort uh, to spend in this sprint. They don't like it. They don't, they, it means that it's more work for them. If you have 10 sprints in a project, it means that they have to update their financial forecast for 10 times. So what do you need to do? Educate them, explain to them. Agile project is lower risk because you get better quality of products, but they, they do need to uh, do more work to, to forecast their, fine, to, make, to do their financial forecast accordingly. And we work closely with their procurement department and commercial department until they really think in say, okay, okay, I'm going to do that to support you. Another thing is, um, um, I heard Project use BA as a product owner, uh, like a proxy product owner, which is fine because it gives us as a BA more opportunity as a product owner. However, from the business mentality, the mindset, they pass the ball to you. Oh, Maria, you are my business product owner. Um, yeah. I don't have to come to your meeting. I don't have to come to uh, stand up. You just tell me what happened. Um, that is a problem. No matter how good we think as a business analyst, we can never, never learn someone who has been in the business for 30 years as a subject matter expert in six months. I can never learn someone working in this area for uh, the last 30 years. So, as much as the title as a proxy product owner, as much as this sounds really nice, we as a BA, we do need to get the physical commitment, engagement, and dedication from the business, from the real subject matter expert to get involved in the project. I actually forced a subject matter expert from the business to come to our stand up. I said, if you come, I don't have to translate all these things to you it will reduce a lot of communication problem. So that's what I, I mean about uh, agile mindset. It's not just the project, but the customer side, their hard work. So the next one is automation. So I mentioned about business owners have started looking at automation to save costs, increase efficiency, and to combat industry, industrial action. Um, so as a BA, we do need to know about what kind of automation uh, using emerging technology to help the business. Um, they, for the automation, um, they don't have to lay off their staff. They can use their staff to produce more uh, value-added work. So it's not uh, totally bad news. Okay, the next one is called data-driven decision-making. A picture is worth a thousand words, um, especially in AI. You know, the, in AI, no matter how good the algorithm is, if you have bad uh, data set, you will have bad AI. Garbage in, garbage out. It doesn't matter the algorithm. So as a BA, if we want to, if we want to become a business advisor, we need to have good knowledge about the data-driven decision-making uh, uh, knowledge. So we need to understand AI, ML, machine learning, data, big data analytics, and also um, infographic, data visualization, data intelligence, 
So we do need to do some more work in order to acquire ourselves to become a business advisor. Um, because we are here to inform business. If I tell the business owner, do this, do that, they said, why? We show them the infographic. We show them the evidence. This is my um, cost and benefits analysis to do that. Um, the last one, sustainability. Can you see? No single use plastic bottle. Lead by example. You have to lead by example. Sustainability, when you go to advise the business, sustainability for long term is benefit to organization because we stop the continue to increase the CO2 to the environment and also renewable energy. We, we can keep the uh, environment cleaner and less polluted. And also, of course, at, at the moment, a lot of countries, they go back to fossil fuel and coal mining. But hopefully, this is short term. For the long term, here are the benefits to the business. Because for re renewable energy, for example, solar is unlimited. They don't have to go to the ground to drill the oil and gas because it's already there. The sun appears every day. So there's so much benefits that we can uh, offer and advise to the business. But first of all, lead by example. You yourself, you have to be sustainable. Um, you have to have a sustainability mindset in order to advise the business. So you have to educate yourself as well. So you, you might ask, um, uh, all this uh, business advisory, advisory stuff, is, they are not new because, um, you know, the management consultant in McKinsey and um, KPMG, they are, they are all doing it. They, it's, it's not new. So why do, you, why do I want you to become a business advisor to compete with a McKinsey management consultant? The answer is very simple. McKinsey management consultant, they advise business what to do. They look at the financial model. They look at the costs and benefits and then they advise the business owner, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. And then they leave. And the business owner holding the report from McKinsey management engineer and management consultant. And they said, okay, um, let's implement the recommendations, uh, set up the IT projects and then the business analysts chip in. But if we become an advisor, we advise the business what to do. We don't have to pass the baton to the business. We do it end to end. We, we give the recommendation. We implement that recommendation. We demonstrate, we save costs and improve efficiency. So there's no miscommunication. I used to work in the uh, government sector and we, um, we hire all the consultants under the sun, mm -hmm. uh, very famous big four consultants. Um, they left the report in our in-tray and then they left. And when I look at the report, I don't know, I, I, I have so many questions to ask them, but they disappear. So what should I do? But if, if there's an end-to-end -end process, I, I am the one to give the recommendation and I'm the one to implement the recommendation. I bet the business will really welcome this situation. And that is the reason why I want us as a BA to expand ourselves from business analysts as well as a business advisor to become a thought leader. And that's what I would like to share with you. So part two is the emerging technologies. Um, I mentioned about automation. Uh, what do we need to know in order to enhance our skills to uh, get involved in the emerging technology projects? So in here, you can see the shape, like right? um, Internet of Things, robotic, um, IoT, uh, satellite, uh, metaverse, etc. So the first one um, is the we need to acquire knowledge about artificial intelligence and machine learning. I am not asking you to be a uh, ML uh, scientist, data scientist or ML uh, engineer. Just to acquire the knowledge as a BA that, so that you can communicate with the implement implementation team. So there are a few uh, key points you need to know about AI. So what AI, artificial intelligence? 
is it artificial or is it intelligence or both? So machine develop the skill and understanding um, artificial intelligence based on algorithm. Machine learning, you train the algorithm, you train the AI to become better and better. And I want to repeat again is you must know the data management. You must ensure data quality and data sets appropriate to put in the AI, mod AI model because otherwise it's just garbage in, garbage out. So we need to work closely with the uh, implementation engineer. And then as a BA, as a business advisor, you identify proactively, okay, what this data set, what this AI can benefit to the business. We identify proactively through data exploitation, through data exploitation that, ah, with this data, with this AI, we can be more uh, closer to the competitive edge uh, against our competitors, etc. And also the last but not the least, is the um, deep learning. Deep learning is about the neural network because now the AI algorithms, not just generated by human, the AI algorithms can be generated by uh, another AI using the neural network um, uh, decision making. So this is a fairly valuable knowledge to uh, acquire. And here I touch base upon open AI and chat GPT. Because AI at the moment is not really regulated, so we need to work out the about ethical, legal, transparency, privacy, and bias. Two weeks ago, I saw a Twitter uh, page. Someone uh, asked ChatGPT to create a poem to sing praise of Donald Trump, and ChatGPT rejected, said they can't do it. Then this person exact the same answer, replace the name Donald Trump to Joe Biden. And all of a sudden, the ChatGPT generated a very long poems about what all the good things uh, done by Joe Biden. And this person, he was really upset uh, because why? They both, one is an ex-US president and one is current US president. And ChatGPT actually had to, uh, like a bias to reject, to generate a poem for Donald Trump. For me, I. I'm not American, I, I'm, I'm neither Democrat or Republican, but I can see there's some bias in ChatGPT already. So, because it's based on the algorithm by human. If the humans is biased, the algorithm will be biased. But we want uh, AI to be more impartial, uh, more transparent and uh, more, more fair to, to different things. So as a BA, when we capture requirements, asking questions, uh, take notice about the ethical transparency and, uh, and also intellectual property aspect of it. So what do we know about IoT projects? So do you, do you know what's IoT, Internet of Things? I think many of you know what's IoT. Um, Internet of Things is actually a computer, but it doesn't look like a computer. For example, in your home, you've got smart fridge. You've got um, the alarm uh, bell, the doorbell, the security alarm. They don't look like um, a computer, traditional computer, but they, they're operated uh, by a computer, by software and hardware. And how many of you have smart meter at home? Smart meter? So oh, quite a few of you. And... Smart meter is the poster boy, poster girl of IoT. We have a smart meter expert here in, in, in the audience. Um, Kit, I used to work with Kit. Kit has been a smart meter uh, senior BA for six years. When you go home, you look at the smart meter. It only tells you how much energy you have spent, but behind it, it does so many things that you don't know behind you. Not only they send it send your usage to the utility suppliers, but also it will look at your pattern, how much energy you use, what time of the day, what day of the week, and what season of the year. They know your lifestyle, and they also look look at um uh, if all of a sudden someone have increased the energy usage uh, tremendously, they will know maybe it's um, a cannabis farm, so they will alert the 
uh, utility supplier and to alert the authority that maybe a, um, a suspected uh, cannabis farm in, in the location. Traditional meter cannot tell. Traditional meter, they either send someone to your house to copy the reading or you submit your reading to your utility suppliers. It's not instant. So if I have a cannabis farm, I won't be fine now until the end of the month, the, the, the earliest. So smart meter is so powerful. It's, a, it's one of the like the representation of uh, IoT. I mean, drone is IoT, robot is IoT, so many things about IoT. So what do you need to know about Internet of Things as a BA? What you need to know is the thing Correct me if I'm wrong, each day, there are like tens of thousands of messages transmitted between the smart meter and the uh, utility suppliers. Yeah, yeah. Thousands. So ex data exploitation, these messages, this data is so useful for the, for the utility supplier. They can plan their, uh, you know, the, the electric generation. Some day they will know what time of the day people will use more energy. So in the national grid, they can they can generate the sufficient uh, energy, not too many and not too little. So they uh, if they generate too much, they will waste the electricity. If you generate too little, some people might uh, suffer blackout. So this these messages are so precious to the utility suppliers, and they can also look at uh, your lifestyle. Uh, for example. If you have um, just two of you, you and your partner, you use less electricity. But if you have a big family, like a family of four or six, they will know ah, this family has um, uh, uh, they use uh, more electricity. Um, they can actually use it for marketing, target marketing. They know your household, they know your pattern, they know your lifestyle. So, but. Don't worry, we are just business business and analyst, business advisor. We're here to support the business. So we help the business to um, identify the opportunity. So that's what we need to know. Um, cybersecurity, uh, you know, I mentioned about the IoT. They, they are actually computer, but they don't look like computers. Some of the IoT, they actually... Um, they can fly, they can uh, uh, run, like robots can run, drone can fly, um, balloon can fly, yeah. So they actually uh, outside the parameter of the controllers. So it's not like a laptop. You don't have to worry about um, uh, the uh, physical safety and physical security of the laptop. But for a drone or for a robot, you need to uh, concern about the security. Uh, last year, I was invited uh, by the University of Sheffield um, Department of Robotic and AI Faculty Student Tournament. Um, I was invited as uh, on the panel of judges. So the student, they will propose their um, uh, AI and robotic uh, proposition, and then we judge them. One of the projects, they proposed to create a robotic arm to go to the ocean to look for uh, rubbish, a uh, plastic bottle because the plastic bottles is very harmful to the sea life. The robotic arm has a scanner to scan the object. If it scan, there's a, a, a life creature, it won't pick it. If scan is um, uh, not a non-life creature, it will grab it because supposedly it will be uh, some kind of rubbish. It can actually scan the shape of the object it, it looks like a bottle is a bottle. So it's quite a clever proposition. And then I said to them, I said, well, in the middle of the ocean, um, what if the, there's a big current sweeping away your robotic arm? How are you going to recover your device? So they need to have some kind of GPS tracking to recover the, the device. And also, they also need to know how long the battery will last. There's, um, for the laptop, I just plug into the uh, uh, a cable, but for the IoT, for the drone robots, uh, all these things, you need to concern about the um, their movement, their physical security, or their battery life. So when you capture the user requirements and uh, using user stories, you will find a lot of non-functional requirements in the traditional IT project all of a sudden become functional requirements. So I have written a thought leadership articles 
about IoT analytics. So if you click this link, you, if you, I can, I will share the copy of my slide that you, with you, and then you will um, see the uh, more detail about the IoT and analytics. Okay, next one is metaverse. So metaverse is the amalgamation between um, augmented reality and virtual reality. So it to it is to create a hundred percent surround um, environment uh, for the users. So the objective is that you can have a virtual meeting like we are uh, in this room. It's a three hundred and sixty. You can see it through the is the the goggles, the the headset, and the and the gloves. And you can do online shopping. You can play computer game. Um, so this is the the. The most important thing is uh, the user experience because as a business analyst, business advisor, you look at the um, requirements, what kind of objects in the environment and what's the functionality. So it's very, very different from the 2D flat screen because the 2D flat screen, you only have a, like an application in front of you. You have the requirements about, okay, the data fields, the application. But in the, in the immersive environment, you need to know the distance, the length and also the uh, surround sound, the volume of noise as well. So that's a lot more complicated than the traditional IT project. Another one is um, please make sure you capture requirements, design the metaverse, just fit for the purpose for the business, because it is very easy to get carried away to over design the project. For example, Mark Zuckerberg, he changed his company name from Facebook to Meta in October 2021. By December 2022, he managed to spend 15 billion US dollars on Metaverse project without taking off. Um, so it's very easy to over-design. So what I would like to advise you is um. I'm not trying to discourage you to get involved in Metaverse project, but not in Mark Zuckerberg's way. I have also written a thought leadership article about um, business analysis in the Metaverse, where I put in details about the user experience. So take that link and read my articles. So the next one is uh, blockchain. So what do you need to know about blockchain as a bit? It's a BA. Blockchain is a technology. It's a distributed uh, ledger system. Instead of the, all the data stored in one single data center. So what does it mean? It means that if this data center is destroyed, it doesn't matter because the blockchain has many other multiple nodes and computers all over the world. The only way to stop blockchain is turn off all the computers in the world. But it's not happening. So. Blockchain is very distributed and between the block, between the block, there is a chain. So it's very transparent, very visible. So if you have a financial transaction, I sell, I sell you some stuff. The, the blockchain will show the transaction, our smart contract, that I sell you this uh, transaction for how much, what date, time. And when you sell to another person is all very visible and they use crypto cryptography cryptography is uh, is also support the um, is a strong password it's quite difficult to hack and um, that's the benefits of um uh, blockchain so the biggest use case of blockchain is bitcoin cryptocurrency at the moment but i think that the other financial system in the fintech fintech industry, they also try, start using uh, blockchain in the traditional financial world. But at the moment, the biggest uh, use case is the cryptocurrency. Uh, I asked, I mentioned about uh, uh, cryptocurrency at the moment is still largely unregulated. So if, if something unregulated, what do you do? You do anything because you don't get arrested, you don't get, uh, you, you don't get into trouble. So as a BA, I mean, I can only tell you that uh, if something, if you if you involved in cryptocurrency blockchain project, if anything against your morality and integrity, walk away. Um, it's up to you. 
So the next one is our uh, uh, robotics projects. So actually, robots is not new. And in the early 90s, when I was doing my PhD in Sheffield University, they have the robotic uh, faculty. And at that time, it's so primitive. So basically, the robots, uh, they use the sensor and actuator. The, the controller has to be in the same room as a robot, and the robot can just walk. But now, with the IoT, with the, with the, with the, with the internet, they just use IP. So I'm the controller. I can be in another country. I can still control the robot. That's the beauty of it. That's the breakthrough of, the, of, of, of robotic technology. So robot is developed very closely with AI and ML because you create a robot. You want the robot to think. So you inject the AI as like a brain to, to the robot. And that's, um, you, so you, you need to understand, okay, the robot is physical. The shape, the size, you know, robot. Some robots, they don't look like a human. Um, in America, I think it's um, a general dynamic. They, they make robots for a battlefield. The robot looks like a dog. They call it robot dog. So the robot comes in uh, different limbs, different uh, shape, different height. So as a BA, you need to uh, capture the size, the capability, and the movement of the robots. And then something more scary is um, I have written a thought leadership paper about swarm intelligence. I actually wrote it two, over two years ago. It's the robot communicate with another robot bypassing human. Totally self-autonomous robots. So what do they do in a battlefield? A drone, a drone communicate with the robot in the cave. The drone finds something, inform the robot that I found something and the robot go to the cave, maybe to detonate a, a bomb which is really, really good idea. However, we turn our clock back to 12 years ago in 2011, there was a movie called I, Robot from Will Smith. At that time, the robots, they talked to each other. They said, let's destroy the human. And then they tried to destroy the world. And thank God, Will Smith, they, he rushed to the warehouse and turned off all the robots and Will Smith saved the world. <laughs> I think, the movie I Robot is not a movie, it's a documentary because it is happening now. With um, swarm intelligence, robots can actually communicate with another robot, making decisions based on the algorithm without any human intervention. Um, yeah, so for further information, click this link and uh, read my uh, thought leadership article. So the next one is about digital twin. I got asked by people, they asked me, Oh, tell me what's the difference between metaverse and digital twin? They seem to be the same. Um, there's a di uh, distinct difference between metaverse and digital twin. Metaverse is totally virtual, 100% virtual, nothing real, nothing real in, in the meta world, metaverse world. Digital twin is the simulation in the computer of a life real object or a process, something real. So the, this is the, um, the function of digital twin. So for example, um, <laughs> in Israel airport, they got a lot of complaint about, you know, the passenger come to, the, uh, to land in the UK, they have the long queue in the immigration, a long queue to get your baggage, a long queue for everything, and then they complain. So, they can create a digital twin to identify when the passenger, the queue, the passenger arrive in the immigration control, the passenger goes to the baggage uh, collection and the passenger go to the, uh, to connect the next flight. So they can simulate the situation. Then they look at where's the bottleneck? Where's the bottleneck? How do we, and, 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 basically is to uh, overcome the, the bottleneck problem. So the digital twin can look at that. Another example is, um, um, you know, Thames Water has a, uh, owns a lot of Victorian uh, water pipe. Victoria means that they are like 200 years old in London. And when something goes wrong, they have to dig up the whole road to look at the cracks. 
for digital twin, they can actually put camera uh, underground and then they use the digital twin to simulate the underground situation and look at ah, the location of the crack. And then they can go to tackle the problem without digging up the whole road. I was involved in a digital twin project. Um, we develop a uh, capability. It's a power uh, generator. We want to increase the power, reduce the noise, and optimize the um, and optimize the uh, um, uh, bandwidth. So, in this situation, we build a digital twin. We test and test and test. How can I increase the power and reduce the noise and optimize the uh, bandwidth? So we test and test until the mathematical uh, equation fits for the purpose of the objective. So we save a lot of money because we don't have to use the physical power generator to test. We use a digital twin to test until the until everything is optimal. So I actually written a thought leadership paper as well. It's called Business Analysis in Brave New World, in which I use the case study to use a digital twin uh, for this project. You might ask, what's the purpose? You, you create a power generator to reduce noise, improve, uh, uh, create, decrease the noise, improve the power, and optimize the bandwidth. What's the point? Well, the power generator will be installed in plane, in aeroplane. So from the commercial viewpoint in the future, if you live near the airport, you will hear less noise about the plane. So you have a better night's sleep. In the military side, if you have a fighter jet, which is very quiet, you might be able to avoid uh, the enemy's uh, detection. So that Really small digital twin project actually has a massive contribution to both military flights and commercial flights. And that's why I, I recorded down as my thought leadership paper. So quantum computing sounds really um, new and very expensive. Yeah, I, I walked past the uh, IBM office the other day and I look at the quantum computer display in the in the door. Wow, I was so impressed. Because quantum compu computing, they use the quantum physics um, logic to develop the quantum computing. The hardware, the software, they're so different from the traditional binary computer. The traditional binary computer is 101010 is 8, but they use quad bit. They also have superposition and they have their own quantum algorithm. So all these features what do they do? They are faster, but they're more accurate. They, are, they can um, manage and handle very, very complex mathematical uh, computation. So what are the use cases for quantum computing? So at the moment, uh, in financial sector, they use, con if they can afford it, <laughs> they use quantum computing for financial model, very complex financial model. And they also use some uh, pharmaceutical companies. They use quantum computing for drugs discovery. They, you have to, there's, drugs are very complicated chemistry. They mix different yeah. chemistry together and to see whether this, chem, this chemistry can tackle some kind of uh, medical condition. So they use quantum computing to develop that because it's fast, it's quick, and it's very, very complex. And supply chain and traffic automation, uh, um, optimization. Supply chain, global supply chain is very complex. The shipment, the logistic, especially um, when you when you export and import food, it's a very important to have good timing and and you have to know the weather condition. They're so so complicated to handle the supply chain and traffic optimization and climate modeling as well. So. Lastly, understand the um, you need to when you when you when you go to advise the business, you need to make sure they need that because you don't want to use a hammer to crack a nut because it is a very costly uh, a way to do it. It's a very very costly uh, uh, quantum computing. Um, so if they have the money, if they have the need, go 
go ahead and do it. So what's my um, summary and conclusion tonight? I look at Homo sapiens, we uh, evolved from monkey, chimpanzee to humans. And then, then we have the invention of computer in the last 30 years. I have been hearing digital transformation since the 90s. Digital transformation, we have the web 1.0, uh, e-commerce in the late 90s. And then in the mid 2000, we have web 2.0, the launch of social media, and the breakthrough is the launch of iPhone in 2008. Um, and then now we have Web 3.0. Uh, the launch of uh, um, Web 3.0 is the um, blockchain and metaverse. So digital transformation has been around for like 30 years. And you might ask, okay, it's been around for 30 years. So what next? What is the next big thing? And for me, I think the next big thing is automation. In this talk, I think I repeat the word automation about 300 times because it will affect our life, affect everybody. Cybernetic operation, uh, automation is um, the machine can think like human to um, conduct manual tasks. And physical automation, the machine act like a human to conduct physical tasks like robotic system. Um, they are there and we, um, we have to prepare for it. Some skeptic, they said to me, no, no, this kind of automation and um, what's it called, bring, bring, bring chip implant, they are years away. I don't think I will see this in my living life. But I'm sorry, I have to tell them that um, they are actually happening now. So here, you, in front of you is a um, DHL depot. It is not coming out from uh, any sci-fi movie. It is happening now, it's today. It's on YouTube. You can click the link and look at the long version. Can you see the robotic arm? The transferring the boxes from the lorry to the command bell, to the stack. You can see this massive warehouse. The only thing you can't find is called human. The whole warehouse, just a robotic arm and stop. So we are, we are embarking in this uh, generation. So my advice to you is, um, um, I will predict that the emerging technologies will become the mainstream. I don't think those country, those company like, um, uh, Oracle, SAP, Salesforce, they are not, they won't be dominating the IT world. It's gone, they've gone. Now, today and tomorrow, those who dominate the IT world will be Elon Musk, Elon Musk Tesla, because he's proactively launching, developing driverless cars. He has Starlink, he has um, SpaceX, and he has the Neuralink. So this kind of company, and another one is called uh, Boston Dynamic. They are the key uh, manufacturer of uh, advanced robotic technology, Boston Dy Dynamic. And another one called Palantir. Palantir is also an American company. It's an AI-focused company. So I think in the, in the future, these companies, Elon Musk, Palantir, and um, Boston Dynamic, they will dominate the world. Thank you so much. So I hope you find my presentation insightful and have some takeaway um, with you. And I'm ready questions, for the questions. Questions from the audience. Uh, <clears throat> hi, uh, Mike Saunderson. You um, uh, talked about the VA being a note taker. And the implication is there are people in the room for whom you are taking notes. And yet some of your examples are about um, where um, the user is another machine. So what, what actually is different about being a BA in that world? Yeah, um, I think 
uh, with the birth of the arrival of the open AI and chat GDP, I actually have friends working as a, a software developer and architect. They are actually thinking about how they can do better than the chat GPT because in the next version, it's not just text. Yeah, it, they actually generate something really uh, sophisticated. I can only speak for BA. I think if BA, if the BA mindset, if they still have the mindset, not taking follower, take instructions, I think their job will be replaced by chat GPT very, very soon. So my advice to you guys in the audience and at home is um, we need to do more work to enhance our skills. You might have a follow-up question that, okay, you've got all this nice technology. How do we learn about this? The answer is BCS. BCS has a very rich resources. You know, BCS, every week, they have about three to four seminars, different seminars, free to members and non-members, about different AI, uh, cybersecurity, robotics, all the uh, specially interest group. So we, BA, is our job to proactively participate in these seminars, go to the resources and learn about the emerging technology so that we, we make sure we have the bargaining power better than AI to survive. Does it answer your question? To extent, yeah. Hi, Simon. Um, I'm going to ask, it's going to be a bit of a long question, forgive me, right? I'll, I'll try to start as I can, but... I think part of the problem, I think you're right, and I really appreciated it, Kitty, your, your presentation. I think it's really good. I think BAs have to change, right? And, and I'm going to tell you why and then ask you a question, right? So if you go back in history and you look at um, the 60s and 70s, right, business learned that just by putting in a new IT system didn't get different business results. It learned that in the 60s and 70s, maybe the end of the 70s, right? And then in the 80s, it learned, well, actually, what you need to do is you need to change the processes, not just the system, but the processes have to change. And then in the 90s, it was if you don't reorganize around those processes, you don't get the benefits either. And then in the early noughties, they started to work out that actually the big fundamental shift is in the mindset, how we think about things, right? System thinking. Well, it's not just system thinking, but it's the mindset that we have of the purpose that we have for the company and the mindset we have about our customers and how we serve them. And then if we don't get that right, Whatever, however we organize process and systems we put in place isn't going to give us high leverage, right? So my, my, my point to you is that I think that the BA has to take that into account and start thinking from the business, not from the IT. We as an industry have always thought about how do we leverage technology into the business? If you're going to, I think, I think to your words you used in your presentation, we need to become more of the SME. We need to be thinking of the business advisory. technology drive, not just advisory, but thinking about the business first and how the technology reacts to it. Because if you go back to the first part, and this is the question, if you go back to the first part of your presentation, right? Yeah. If you did that pestle analysis from a completely different mindset, you did it to find challenges based on a whole bunch of horrible things that happened in 2022. Yeah. If you took a, my question is, do you think that if you took a positive view, you could have come up with a very different set of opportunities rather than challenges? And wouldn't that help a BA to help the business going forward? Yeah, I have three parts of my presentation. The first part, reporting in the pestle, reporting. So I just report what's going on in 2022. Then analyzing. Oh, this bad news. What's the impact on our profession? The third part, Turn the challenges and threat to opportunity. I got that, but forgive me, let me be clear about what I'm saying, right? If you started your pestle analysis with saying politics, interesting things happened in 2022, which are positive. COP22 built on the climate change. What does that mean from an economic point of view? Well, we're starting to talk about the circular economy and, and recycling and, and things like that. From that, you say, okay, well, how does that happen? What are the societal inclusion that we're able to now draw new communities that we never did before? And I could go through that pest analysis and create opportunities out of it. Ah, okay. Not, not challenges yeah, and threats. That's fine. That's fine. Um, your approach is absolutely spot on. And so the pestle analysis, the build of pestle analysis, uh, you can use the pestle to uh, identify what level in your example. Fine. No, no problem with that. In my, I mean, I I'm kind of took a big wheel to say, oh, we are not in a good shape. 
but I managed to turn the that opportunity to opportunities. And I I think we do have opportunity, but the one thing is that we it doesn't come free. We do need to do um some work. And I am in the process of writing the book, and my book will be the elaboration version of all I have told you tonight. And hopefully that book will become my legacy to um, share with the uh, business analysts and the uh, wannabe business advisor in the future so that they have some kind of equipment when they go to the workplace, when they start doing, when they start getting involved in the emerging technology projects, automation. Thank you, Simon. Any question online? Oh, okay, another one. You think words are always negative or always damaging? <laughs> Words are also beneficial to many. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree mm -hmm. with you. I mean, the, um, we sometimes there's an elephant in the room. We, we, it's a very big elephant. We try to not to mention it, not, to, uh, not try pretend not to see it. But I'm the one, I, I'm, I'm coming here. I said, excuse me, can you see the elephant? That's me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, we've got a question from Paolo online. One of the threats to growth that is often mentioned is regulation, but is there power and value in regulation? Yeah, um, as a BA, absolutely, we don't have the power. We are not a lawmaker. We are not policymaker. We don't run the government. However, as a BA, when we work in a project, we pay attention to the compliance, to the regulations. I mean, Jurisdiction can change. So if the jurisdiction change to protect the uh, business interest, to protect the users, and we we will, we will be the one to know. Um, the whole idea of um, regulation is actually to reduce the harm to the users and to protect the business interest. So uh, hopefully, um, sooner or later, in the EU or UK or America, the Western world, they will have some kind of um, uh, system to govern and regulate the uh, uh, emerging technologies. We've got another question from Paolo. Interested in your thoughts on who would take the lead to regulate crypto and who would sponsor it out of whose taxes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, one of my... Um, like that is uh, there was a white paper. Um, I need to go back, 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 back. Okay, yes. Um, that one. Um, Deloitte. Um, Deloitte, as you know, is a big four. Um, they produce a white paper. You can you can search online. Uh, they push the regulation to set the re to regulate cryptocurrency uh, market, like casino like traditional banking system because you you because those um uh, traditional banking system they have a very long history i bet 200 years ago uh, the banking system was like a west wild west world uh, but now we we the cryptocurrency market is like 200 years ago in uh, traditional financial markets so hopefully the the governments, they will uh, implement the, some regulations to govern the cryptocurrency markets. But at the moment, I don't think there is, there is any up to now. Have you got one final question online? How would you merge business analysis with professions such as enterprise architecture, system engineering, finance law or strategy into your proposed business advisory function? And who should lead? I suppose this is a question of scope and at what level the business advisory function. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm still learning. I'm still, a, yeah, I'm not expert. So I'm not asking all of you to go to get MBA. You know? um, we, we already have a, uh, we are quite an experienced business analyst and there are um, avenues and the resources we can go to uh, learn about uh, strategy, system thinking, more high level. Like Simon just said, is a think about business rather than IT. Think about business. When you think a business, you think about what the what the customer wants rather than what the technology can um, uh, produce. In the in the in the big tech environment, 
when they have they when they have issues, they fix it uh, by changing the code without asking exactly what's going on from the customer feedback. Since I I work in the high tech uh, sector before, and any. And every time when there's a problem, the, the techies will just change the code. But then as a BA, I'm sitting in between. Let me ask the customer first. Let me ask them what they what, what the feedback, what they want. So my advice is, um, is to change our mindset to look at strategy, to look at business customer wants, and to also look at the global uh, event to uh, broaden our horizon to get involved into everything around us uh, in the real world rather than just the technology. Okay, we've got two more questions, but do you want to take any from the room? Yeah, any more questions? Oh, yeah, you've got a question. Uh, you mentioned about BS transitioning into business advisory. How open do you think the companies are in allowing BS to do that transition? So, um, when you when you get in the project, yeah, you probably you uh, in a traditional BA, you go to the project, you report to the project manager, you this. So you have to change your attitude and your approach in the in the workplace. So you need to be more proactive about the uh, whether the project add value to the business. You need to go above and beyond to come out of your comfort zone. And you identify any problem, you escalate to um, more senior people. You have to um, basically fight for your opportunity. And if you do the job well, you can uh, get more opportunities to look at more the, especially now we are in the climate that business owners, they don't have much money to spend. They will really welcome a lot of suggestions and recommendations how they run their business more efficiently and with less money and improve the performance and to improve their competitive advantage. They will welcome that. I'm telling you, the the those days when Google provide free meal to their staff with free uh, company car, those days gone. Because I think I heard about Google just uh, make thousands of employees in America redundant. So they, even Google, they they look at redundancy as well. So yeah, be proactive. That's my suggestion. Simon. Can I come in on that point? I think we've got to stop thinking about the employees and the business as separate things. It's not the employees telling the business what to do. It's the employees as part of the business saying, hey, we could do this differently. And any business leader would want that. Right. If it's good advice, they want it. The, the issue is how do you get the how do you change the, the perception of what a BA used to be perceived as into something that adds value in giving advice? And that is all the things you were talking yeah. about. Go out, be bold and do it. Yeah. Um, as you know, in the past uh, six, seven years, six, seven years, I uh, work in consultancy uh, business. Uh, we don't treat ourselves as a supplier of our customers. We call ourselves partner. So partner is a, we, we um, work together to focus the uh, same goal. So when, you, when your relationship with your customer becomes your business partner, you tend to kind of uh, blend yourself into the business environment. Um, it's not easy, but you get used to it. Uh, uh, the, the word I would like to share with you is uh, be proactive. Yeah. Uh, David. I'll do one last question online. Um, exciting to hear about emerging technologies. Do you really believe that back office ERP, such as SAP and Oracle, will end compared to the fact that most transactions are still processed on COBOL? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, there's still a lot of legacy system in the world, but they are the one thing very important the legacy system, they're not increasing. They're not increasing, they're there. And over the years, they will be um, out of service, replaced by more uh, modern technology, emerging technology. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter. I, I do agree that uh, the COBOL uh, legacy system, they still exist. I mean, airlines, they, they, they still use it, yeah? Uh, 
But we university stopped teaching COBOL, Pascal, Fortran. You know, stop. It means that nobody is going to develop a new system using Fortran or Pascal or COBOL. No. So they will just be replaced over the time. <laughs> Steve, you've got a question. Yeah, you've been about the business advisor role. Um, I mean, we're clearly an IT, IT background, but the business advisor presumably needs domain knowledge. So for people interested in moving in that direction, what sort of hints, tips or suggestions would you offer for, for people wishing to look in that direction? So what you need to do that um you can you can choose to you can choose to learn the uh business strategy, the business advisory aspect like management consultant in McKinsey, in Deloitte. You know, they 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 are educated like an MBA or CFA. Have you ever heard of CFA? Carter Financial Analysis is a very good qualification. Yeah. Or they or you can learn it on the job, in the job. I mean, for me. I have a computer science PhD, but I don't have an MBA. So I'm still learning, uh, but I'm leaning myself inclined to this direction to become more business alert rather than just focus on IT projects. That, that's my advice to the audience and the listener. Um, two ways you can uh, obtain formal training, uh, learn, it, learn it throughout. I mean, I'm not trying to promote LinkedIn, but then LinkedIn, there's so many free courses. I mean, on YouTube, or talk to people, ask them questions, um, share those people. If you have, if you happen to, um, luckily, you if you if you have the opportunity to shadow your COO or CEO, shadow them. You just look at what they do and gain the gain the knowledge. Yeah, Angus might want you to shadow him. <laughs> The CEO of a smart meter project uh, program, yeah, um, yeah. That that's the so many ways to 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 enhance your skills. Thank you very very much, Katie. That was very informative and interesting talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>